Welcome to this video and in this video we're going to have a look at how we calculate the mass of an exoplanet using the radial velocity method. So with the transit method where a planet passes in front of the star and blocks out some of the light, <clears throat> we can get the radius and the orbit of the exoplanet using that particular method. But what we can't do is we can't get the mass. So we need a different method in order to get the mass to get the full information of that particular system and that is the radial velocity method. So with this method, we're going to actually look at the orbit or the system, kind of edge on, hopefully it's edge on, sometimes it's kind of inclined, or most of the time it will be. Now here you have an exoplanet and a star, and they're orbiting a common center of mass. But because the star is so much larger than the exoplanet, the orbit of the star is a lot smaller. Now we can't actually measure the radial velocity of the exoplanet, but we can measure the radial velocity of the star. So what happens is as the planet is orbiting around, the star has a bit of a wobble and we can measure that using the Doppler shift. So we can measure the velocity, the radial velocity of that star, but not on the exoplanet. So we get the velocity of the star by looking at the shift in the light coming from it due to the Doppler effect. So as it travels away from us, it becomes red shifted to so the light, it becomes slightly redder and as it travels towards us, it becomes slightly bluer, so it's blue shifted. And we look at these the spectral lines to figure out how fast it's actually moving. So using the Doppler shift equation here, now normally we would typically use something like the H alpha line for stars. It's a fairly strong absorption line, which is highlighted there, which is in the red part of the spectrum. So that is about 656 six nanometers. And then we would measure the shift from that wavelength, which is your delta lambda. And then we can work out the actual velocity of the star. And then we would plot that over time to get the radial velocity cur or radial velocity plot. We can then get the period from that. And then we can get the peak orbital velocity as well, which is the maximum radial velocity during its orbit. So if we assume that the exoplanet and the star have the same orbital period, then they're going to have the same momentum. So the mass of the star times the velocity of the star is equal to the mass of the planet times the velocity of the planet. Now we know the mass of the star and the velocity of the star. We can measure the velocity of the star. The mass of the star we can get from other methods, which we had a look at in some other videos. So now we need to work out the velocity of the exoplanet before we can work out the mass of it. So here we've got one last thing we need to actually find in order to get our exoplanets. So first we need to find the orbital radius or the seven major axis for the exoplanet. So what we can do is we can use Kepler's third law to find this. So we could have done this with the transit method as well actually. So here the seven major axis can be given at the bottom there. Now we're going to assume that we know the mass of the star and this is found you know from other methods really and the orbital period is the same as the period of the star, which we can get from the radial velocity method or from the transit method if it's transiting. So we're just left with finding A. Now, once we've found A, we can then get the circumference of the orbit. We know the orbital period P. So we can work out the orbital velocity of the exoplanet. Now, this assumes that it's a, a circular. If it's not circular and it's elliptical, then this isn't going to be the orbital velocity. So this is a rough approximation on how we might do it. So now we can find a minimum mass for this exoplanet because we've got a velocity for it. Now it's worth noting that it's a minimum mass because we don't necessarily know what the inclination is. So we're assuming that we're looking completely edge on and we're getting the maximum radial velocity when it's traveling towards us. But if it's inclined, then actually some of it won't be towards us. We can't measure that component. So normally when we use the radial velocity method and we don't know the inclination, it's going to give us a minimum mass. So that's what we can actually work out in this particular method. So thank you for watching. 